Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Earthly Headlines. Uh, today we're going to talk about this giant undersea freshwater aquifer that they found off the U.S. Northeast, which is uh, linked directly to the Younger Dryas boundary and the last glacial maximum. Um, if you guys listen to the Grimerica podcast that I uh, did a, a few days ago, I talked uh, briefly, not briefly, but I talked at length about um, the Younger Dryas boundary and, and the last glacial maximum and all this meltwater and the rise in sea levels by 400 feet and so on. And if I was someone just starting out and, and reading about the Younger Dryas and, and 12,800 years ago and how <clears throat> the giant ice sheet over uh, North America just simply vanished and melted uh, in a violent uh, catastrophe, then one of my first questions would be, well, where did all that water go aside from the obvious into the uh, what exactly happened to the fresh water there and how does it react with the salt water so that's what this article talks about and it's out of columbia university and it was published in the science i think science report journal let me see yeah scientific reports uh journal so this is legitimate legitimate science here and uh if you don't know for is let's just start with that so a normal aquifer is basically anything, whenever you see a well, it's tapping into this groundwater, that it's fresh groundwater that you could access by just by digging. So uh, some of this uh, water throughout whatever landmass it may be, they have uh, water that's trapped underneath. Well, in a seabed, underneath the seabed, the same thing is going on, except it's under a layer of salt water as well. So uh, just to just with that out of the way, I just don't want people to get confused about what an aquifer is. So um, scientists have mapped a huge one, and w when you see this image here, you can see the yellow uh, checkered uh, part. This is where it all is. This is all the freshwater um, aquifers that they've mapped out now, and the way that they found it was pretty interesting. So. Oil companies would, in the 70s, they would go out and drill, some were mainly in New Jersey and mainly in Massachusetts up here. They would basically essentially poke holes in the, on the continental shelf and see what they can get. And what they were pulling up were, were, was a bunch of fresh water, not the oil that they were looking for. So, um, so one of the scientists that, that was contracting his services out to these companies, he decided that, well... If there's fresh water here and there's fresh water up here, then maybe they aren't just random pockets of fresh water. Maybe they're all over the place. So he just uh, went about and did this research and uh, this ten, culminating in this 10 day study where he and a few other ge hydrogeologists were trying to figure out the extent of all the fresh water here. And they found out that it was all uniform it wasn't random pockets. Uh, so I'll get into that more right now. So um, so they find this gigantic aquifer of relatively fresh water trapped in porous sediments lying below the salty ocean, the largest of such formation yet found in the world. Um, it spans from Massachusetts to New Jersey, extending more or less continuously out about 50 miles to the edge of the continental shelf. So here's the continental shelf here. So between the shore and the edge of the shelf, and into the the Atlantic abyssal zone is about 75 miles. And that's obviously the extent of all the fresh water here. Um, so it would create a lake covering. Uh, if, if all this water were to have been found on the surface, it would have created a giant freshwater lake covering about 15,000 square miles. So that's the amount of water that we're talking about here. And how much fresh water appears like that unless it was some catastrophic event and so the only amount of fresh water that could account for that uh, that number is the Laurentide ice sheet that was resting above North America 20,000 to 15,000 years ago um, so researchers employed innovative measurements of electromagnetic waves to map the water um, headed by uh, uh, Chloe Gustafson she well she's a lead author anyway and so um, she's saying that they use this electromagnetic uh, wave pulse technology to map it out. And I'll get into that more in a second. 
um, scientists back in the 70s, like I mentioned, they were drilling uh, the coastline for oil. Scientists were debating whether these water deposits were just isolated pockets or something bigger. Um, so uh, uh, the other co-author of the study, Kerry Key, he's the guy who helped the companies develop these techniques. This electromagnetic imaging technique to uh, look at the sea, the sub sea floor to look for oil. Then he decided in 2015, years and years later, um, they made measurements off of uh, southern New Jersey and Massachusetts Island off Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and then basically what they did specifically was drop receivers to the seafloor to measure the magnetic fields below and the degree to which natural disruptions such as solar winds and lightning strikes resonated through them. The apparatus towed behind the ship also emitted ar artificial electromagnetic pulses and recorded the same type of reactions from the sub seafloor. So how do they separate the salt water from the, from the uh, fresh water? Well, salt water is a better conductor of electromagnetic waves than fresh water. So the fresh water stood out because of the fact that it's a band of low conductance. So it would appear on the, in the, in the image, it would look a lot different and it would look again it would appear as like a band so if you were to look here it would look something like this it would be very uh very distinct um and then because of this analysis they found out that the deposits aren't scatters they're, they're continuous they start at the shoreline and extend far out within the sh uh, continental shelf and basically it's about between 600 to 1200 feet below the ocean so this band of fresh water is just sitting there and this is what it looks like, this electromagnetic receiver. Very interesting stuff, this technology that they had since the 70s. And they've only utilized it for this case as recently as four years ago. So go figure, that's the, the snail's pace of science, scientific discovery. Um, so now they're that, that they're confident of, of this continuous span of fresh water, that holds at least 670 cubic miles of fresh water. They, wanna, uh, they wanted to uh, figure out, okay, where did this water come from? So toward the end of the last glac uh, glacial maximum, the world's water was locked up in mile deep of ice. And then when the water obviously melted, it had to go somewhere. Uh, and so these sediments, when it crashed down into the settlements, these for it formed these huge river deltas on top of the shelf and then water got trapped inside between uh, the headway that the impact made and the sediments uh, on top. And basically, it appeared that they were trapped in scattered pockets, but these scattered pockets are continuous, if that makes sense. And then the sea levels uh, rise, and then you have this, um, this repository of uh, fossil water. Uh, the researchers say that the new findings indicate that the aquifer is also being fed by modern subterranean runoff from the land. As water from rainfall and water bodies percolate through onshore sediments, it's likely pumped seaward by rising and falling pressure of tides. He likened this to a person pressing up and down on a sponge to suck in water from the sides. Um, another interesting tidbit of this is the freshest water is near the shore, and it gets saltier the further out, which suggests that it gradually mix mixes with ocean water over time. So fresh water on the land usually contains less than one part per thousand salt. And then regular seawater is about 35 parts per thousand. And then if you look at the outer reaches of, the, of this aquifer, it's reached uh, uh, levels up, up and around 15 parts per thousand. So we can see what this means basically to the layman is you can see that this water, A, was, if you look at it from the time scale of Earth, Within a relatively short amount of time, it's this water. I mean, a, t a short amount of time ago, this water d was dumped in the water. So it wasn't in the seawater. So it wasn't that long ago in the scope of the Earth's lifespan. And also, it's starting to, not starting to, but it's well within that process of salinization. It, this fresh water is becoming salinized by the seawater gradually over and by gradually I mean a period of thousands of years so this is about again 12,000 13,000 years ago that this water hit hit the seawater and then now it's just starting to get I guess integrated with the rest of the seawater and probably in another 
fifty thousand years or so, um, all that all that fresh water would invariably turn into salt water. Um, so again, it's very interesting that there is an aquifer here. Again, we see these footprints of this younger Dryas event, and um, again, just add this to the pile of of evidence that something did happen. Some crazy thing happened that made these giant ice caps just melt within a short amount of time and then you have right now or what we have now are this what when we track this melt this freshly melted water if you take a time machine let's say and go back the evidence that we have of this catastrophic event of this water is we have the tracks so like the missoula flood all all the, the channeled scab lands all of these different uh, uh, scars on the landscape that are kind of like the footprints again of of this meltwater, and then now we have the actual meltwater where it was in question. This this fossilized water was at one point rampaging through the landscape, and what more do we need now? I mean, we have we even found the 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 smoking gun evidence of the. The comet itself that in the underneath uh, Greenland uh, earlier last or not er, earlier this year or late last year, we found that that Greenland um, uh, uh, crater. So it's pretty much a done deal that we know for sure now that some some cosmic debris hit the ice cap, the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheet, and now we have these aquifers as its legacy. So let me know what you guys think about this. Um, I think it's very interesting, and it's a huge, huge boon to our uh, understanding of what happened and where that water came from uh, that is derived from this uh, YDB, Younger Dryas Boundary event. So yeah, uh, leave some comments. Uh, let me know what you guys thought about the Gra that Gramerica podcast. I thought those guys are really interesting and pretty funny. Um, I highly recommend you guys uh, listen to that. I don't think it's out on iTunes yet. I think it'll probably be out either today or tomorrow on iTunes. So definitely um, listen to that if like on the commute or something. And all the all the feedback has been nothing but positive. So uh, yeah, um, show them some love, guys, and I'll talk to you later.